thank you for joining us again. This is a continuation of the previous episode. As always, here's your host, Nikesh Gosdalia. I know that Kudos not only works with publishers, societies, institutions, but also supports researchers directly. So can you maybe you know talk about how did that process evolve? You know, why did you think about offering services directly to researchers? And maybe very briefly, you know, talk about what kind of services would be beneficial for researchers. Sure. Yeah, I think as the, what we were doing evolved and as the kind of world evolved around us and we began to be more tuned in to what people were struggling with, we could just start to see this couple of gaps emerging. And I, I think one is obviously that institutions are not structured or funded in a way that they have the capacity to communicate all the different research they support, you know. They have fantastic teams and experts who do a fantastic job with the sort of, you know, the best research coming out of an institution. But the the nature of their model is that they just can't extend that level of support to everything that's happening within an organization. So there is a need for researchers to be able to tap into other sources of, of support and skills and services. And so we started to see that as well as providing what we're doing through institutional models, we could also um, support people directly where we were the right fit for what they needed to do. And then I think the other sort of gap that we saw emerging was was this sort of the fact that the most powerful way to interest broader audiences is to make it really meaningful for them, which means kind of pulling together stories around research that are not going to draw neatly on, on research that's only happened in one institution or only in one field or only in one publication. Actually, the real story of, of research advancing and, and progressing tends to happen in, in a kind of much more holistic way. So, there is a role for somebody who's not constrained by any of those silos to be drawing it together and saying, do you know what, this is really interesting. Look at that piece of research from Australia, that bit from Sweden, that bit from Nigeria. Let's put all of that together. Gosh, isn't that interesting? What a tale that tells us about where we might all be in 10 years time or whatever. So I think that that was a real penny dropping moment for us that seeing that actually that need wasn't being met and there was a role that we could play and we had some skills and a platform that could fit this need perfectly. We've spoken a lot about publishers, societies, institutions using QDOS in a certain way, and a lot of information is available, you know, within the industry. But how does QDOS also help disseminate that information outside the industry? Yeah, this is a, an area that I think we've really stepped up to the plate in in the last few years actually and become much more active in what we do because I think at first we sort of you know didn't, didn't want to be too arrogant well, well somebody somewhere must be doing this or must be doing that and, and gradually it was like oh they're, they're really not actually or not in any uh, sort of structured way that that makes it easy for researchers to tap into and take advantage of so we've really started to do more around the kind of showcasing on themes and topics the storytelling around those topics um, and doing more promotion and recognizing that we can't just be another place that information exists. The value that we can add is to sort of spread the cost of promotion across an entire audience or partner base of researchers and publishers and societies and everybody getting more kind of bang for their buck if we then centrally create and promote these these stories and these showcases. Um, So we've been doing a lot of work around using social media, using paid search and advertising, doing PR activities around it. and, And again, using all these existing existing channels where these existing audiences exist to then push out stories in a much more proactive way and in a much more audience centric way so that it's not about here is one publication or one piece of research but here's a narrative here's some really interesting information that covers five or six different pieces of research um, and we'll promote that as a group and then really think about when the people then come through and read more information on our site how we're then going to surface more stuff that's of interest to you so yeah the, the sort of um dissemination, publicizing, promotional side of things is something we've really stepped up because it it just wasn't happening in, in a kind of comprehensive way anywhere else. You briefly mentioned showcases, um, typically showcases give research findings, which have normally been very formal, you know, social media or a, or a blog kind of a look. After you've implemented showcases, any interesting observations that you've seen from the scholarly communications industry? 
Yeah, I think it's been, so this is still quite a new area of development for us. And I think what has been really interesting is is that this thematic approach is really popular and the sort of magazine style approach that we're taking um, is not sort of radical in itself. We're really looking to things like Pinterest and other sort of medium sites and things like that that have inspired the user journey that we've developed. But this the ability to do that and to partner with other people so that that's happening across publishers, across universities, that feels like it's the piece that has been missing. And so that it's been exciting to see the the kind of ex- the interest in that the support for that the willingness of publishers and institutions to experiment a little bit with us on this and to um, all kind of learn together about when you create that kind of interface to scholarly content and then when you promote it you know which which channels are most effective for bringing people to that and what do people do once they've got there and how, how do they use this information or sort of what value does it does it give them depending on you know some of the different ways that they might describe themselves if they're a member of the public or if they're a, a clinical practitioner or um, you know somebody working as a policymaker or, or an industry or something like that so we're we're really starting to drill into capturing that kind of audience information and then looking at the differences in terms of how people find and use this information and so the, the showcases have been sort of the really powerful front end for a lot of that experimentation and, and data capture at the back end. And it's been really exciting to, to have so much publisher interest in that because obviously there's going to be a lot of lessons that we all learn as a group for, for what we can do more of in future to, to help reach these different audiences and help report on that engagement to researchers, to institutions who really need to be able to understand more about how do you make sure that the research is influencing the audiences that it has potential for. I mean, we all know climate change is a real thing now. And, you know, we all have become more aware. We're starting to do our own bits. But I'm also aware that both for you individually, Charlie, and even for QDOS as an organization, it, it has been a major cornerstone, you know, of your foundation. So what efforts have you made in that regard? It might be really interesting for the listeners to hear some thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. This was became a big focus of our work last year when the COP26 meeting was held in the UK. So it felt very close to home for all of us here. And we really wanted to think about, is there something that we can do? Is there more that we should be doing? Which of course there is. So uh, we started by working with publishers, with universities, researchers to, to try and collate a collection of content, a curated collection of content saying, look, this is some of the key stuff around climate research. We will bring together and we will explain in plain language what this research was and what the implications of that should be for us. Um, And and it was a really interesting process because it it combined some of the earliest climate science. So we had um, papers put forward for inclusion that included some of the really earliest science from the 1960s where, you know, we've realised for the first time and we had the data for the first time that said, yes, the growth in carbon dioxide does contribute to an increase in temperatures. And some of those really early findings and studies right through to having, you know, very, very current data in there and and science in there uh, with the latest developments around how are we going to make green fuels more efficient or more effective or more scalable and things like that. So really interesting span to help people kind of understand and shape people's understanding of, you know, know, yes, is climate change real? Well, actually, yes, here's the data that shows that. Is it largely caused by human activity? Here's the data that supports that assertion. So really trying to address the core aspects of it as well as, you know, and at the cutting edge of it, what should we build all be doing or how is science going to to save us from this and that sort of thing. That was a really interesting um, piece of work that, you know, we, when we launched, we had, I think, about 100 summaries of climate research and we're now closing in on, I think, 300. So it's a continuing to grow. We're continuing to add new explanations of climate science in a way that anyone can understand. You know, we're aiming to make this something that school children can understand, that you don't need a high level of education because it, you know, affects everybody. We also want to make sure that the summaries that we're adding can be easily put through kind of browser auto translation so that wherever you are in the world, you've got a hope of kind of understanding this research, understanding its implications for you, what you can do personally or how it might be going to affect you in future. 
future. And again, to try and expand that reach, we've been promoting that really actively through social media and adverts and lots of blog posts and articles in the press and things like that, really recognising that it's not enough just to make these summaries available, that you have to push them out there. And you have to do that with striking imagery and catchy headlines and clickbait, essentially, um, but but kind of ethical and, and not uh, not misleading. Just But, you know, you don't need to try and mislead people with the climate science. The, the findings are serious enough and eye-catching enough by themselves when they're distilled down to, to you know, a headline and an advert. So it's been a really um, rewarding piece of work to be doing. For me, it feels personally like the bringing together of my whole career, you know, everything that I've done to focus on research communication is really finding a, a mission to serve with this kind of project. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, you sort of were asking about the implications for us at QDAS. It, even, it has trickled down to things like, you know, when we did our first exhibition after coming back from the pandemic, we sourced completely renewable materials for that. So we built a stand out of cardboard, but ordered the one that could be folded up and reused again in the future. So, you know, really, um, it's been very interesting for me personally and professionally, but also for us as an organisation to, to kind of put our skills and our abilities behind some of these big themes. And we're doing that now, you know, we're, we're launching the same kind of thing around coronavirus and pandemics and what is it going to mean for the world to live with these kinds of things potentially more often in future. We're bringing forward a, a similar initiative, actually, which we have planned for a bit further into the future, but we're bringing forward one to do with kind of war and peace and what, what research can tell us as individuals in the wider world about, you know, how we should use our vote. What should we know about why wars start and how they can best be ended and what can we best do to support veterans and refugees and people who've been victims of war and forced migration. So, you know, there's so much that that research can, so many ways in which research findings can benefit people in the wider world and have really relevant implications. And we just need to keep taking down the barriers so that more people understand that, find it, have the information they need to, to change their behaviour or whatever in the right moment, right place, right time. I mean, this is this is fascinating, and it's such a great initiative, uh, Charlie. Because you know, like you rightly said, there's so much data that's available there. It's, it's behind paywalls, and at the same time, you know, there's so much of a need to understand that in simple, plain language. And you know, QDOS is pretty much kind of doing that. And you've answered that question already for me. That has the climate change initiative motivated you to pick up so many other relevant topics, but you've already kind of mentioned that. So that's a fantastic initiative. Maybe kind of moving away from the the industry, I just had a, a question which a lot of listeners, I'm sure, might be curious about as well. So wearing your founder's hat and, and you know, uh, uh, having been in this role for the last, you know, 10 years, what would be your one tip or learning or any reflection, Charlie, in terms of anybody looking to convert their passion, you know, their experience into you know, yeah, full-time work? Mm, yes, great question. Um, I think... Uh, well, personally, uh, at Kudos, we're lucky because there were three of us that founded the company. And that has meant that all along the way, when we've had things that we didn't know what we were doing, or we've had to do things that were really difficult, or painful, or hard to make decisions, we always had each other to draw on and kind of bounce ideas from and, and to support each other. And I think that, you know, I'm so grateful for that. I look at people who are sole founders of organizations and think, my goodness, who was supporting you through that journey? Um, I think one of the things Things that seems obvious in retrospect, but I don't think really un I understood at the time is that whatever the nature of your innovation, your idea, in the end, you're running a company and make sure that you distinguish between those two things and understand where your skill set is best placed you know are you going to be best at continuing to develop the ideas of and is your inclination and your aptitude suited to furthering the the fit of what you do with what your market needs or are you going to be good at running a company managing people looking after observations uh, operations and finances and things because they're very very different you might be able to do both well done if you can <laughs> but more likely you're not and i think it's really common to see sort of founder-led businesses 
struggle because the founder is still the CEO or whatever the equivalent position is. And their skill set is not in running a business. And they don't want to be running a business. They want to be out there leading the innovations. So I think that's something that it gets lost in the mix. And particularly, you know, in our sector, you see loads of very cool um, academic led innovations and enterprises, but so many, too many that sort of collapse under the weight of becoming a business as opposed to a, a side project. So I think being realistic about that and, and getting the support you need and the people around you to run it as a business is, is probably one of the biggest lessons that I just hadn't really thought about prior to getting to the point of, of needing that kind of support ourselves. That's a wonderful insight. And thank you for sharing that, Charlie. I know that you're very active as far as you know our industry is concerned in terms of writing your own thought leadership pieces. But how do you keep yourself updated with science-related news or industry updates? Oh, I think I'm pretty old school. I mean, in terms of the actual research that's going on, it's through QDOS. You know, people are posting their work on our site every day and I have a little feed of that that I keep an eye on. So that keeps me up to speed with kind of what's going on out in the wider world of research. In terms of the more SciCom or, or you know, industry-oriented stuff, I'm on email discussion lists, email alerts, newsletters, things like that, blogs. And going to events, actually, or, or participating in online events is, is probably one of the ways in which that information, I I focus on it most exclusively and therefore sometimes get most from it. But I'm pretty old school. Yeah, it's mostly email based. (laughs) (laughs) But that's fine. I mean, yeah, I I do the same. And I'm sure a lot of people uh, you know, do that. So so thank you for that, Charlie. It was a very fascinating conversation as always. And I know there were so many insights based on our conversation, but just to kind of talk about a couple of things, I thought, you know, the just the importance of, you know, promotion in the context of research and the way you explained that was was wonderful. I think the increasing involvement of so many stakeholders, right, starting from funders to societies, to publishers, to institutes, uh, researchers themselves, of course, and a lot of the, you know, organizations uh, like ours is, is starting to grow. And that's very encouraging considering public engagement, dissemination, promotions becoming so important. And I thought one other insight which was which was really powerful was the fact that, you know, storytelling doesn't have to be just restricted to probably one university, one institute, a certain set of researchers. It's it's now taking it across countries, across geographies, across institutes. And that was such a wonderful insight that obviously, you know, through your experience with QDOS that you gained and now, you know, you're doing more and more work around it. But yeah, I mean, I thought, you know, yeah, there were so many useful insights. Uh, and as always, like I said, thank you so much uh, for your time, Charlie. Oh, thank you. That's, it's great to hear that uh, there's been something to gain from it. And it's been great to chat. Thank you for some great questions, great, great thoughts to be considering together. So thank you, Charlie, for being our guest on All Things Psycom. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. You can subscribe to this podcast on all major podcast platforms. Stay tuned for our next episode. All Things Psycom is brought to you by Science Talks, a science media channel that aims to make science accessible to all. We publish articles, videos, podcasts, and magazines. To read a transcript of this episode or watch it on YouTube, visit sciencetalks.org. Also, write to us with your views, questions, and guest recommendations at contact at sciencetalks.org. Science Talks, bringing science to you.